Okay then, let's get started with session two. For those of you who are just joining us now, a warm welcome to Democratic Socialism and Global, Global Perspective, an international conference organized by the Transnational Institute and UW Madison Havens Wright Center for Social Justice. My name is Pete Romand. I work for the Havens Wright Center for Social Justice, and I'm one of the main organizers of this conference. I'm currently completing a PhD on populism and nationalism in Europe, and I'm an activist in Scotland, where I'm a member of the Contra Editorial Board, and among other things, I was a founding med member of the Radical Independence Campaign, and I will be serving as moderator for this session. This session of the conference is titled Feminism, Socialism and Intersectional Politics. I'm very excited by the gr brilliant group of people who we've brought together for this panel. I'll introduce each speaker in more detail before they speak, but for now, uh, I want to mention who they are and welcome them to this discussion. The panelists are Tithi Bhattacharya uh, from Purdue University, Lilian uh, Celiberti uh, from Articulación Feminista Marcosur, and Gina Vargas from uh, Flora Tristan Center. Before providing a fuller introduction, I'd uh, like to go over the format briefly. Each panelist will be given around 20 minutes, and after that, we will have 60 minutes for discussion. You can share your questions throughout the session via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen in the Zoom control panel. I'll also invite questions and contributions from other conference speakers who are going to be speaking uh, throughout the week. So I'd ask you to prepare uh, uh, that and come in when the panelists have finished speaking. With that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Tithi Bhattacharya. Tithi is an Associate Professor of South Asian History at Purdue University. She's a prominent Marxist feminist and a vocal advocate of Palestinian rights and boycott, divestment and sanctions. She's one of the authors of Feminism for the 99%, a manifesto which ties feminism to other modes of struggle, including anti-racism and anti-capitalism. On the topic of gender, Bhattacharya has further authored the book The Sentinels of Culture. In addition, she's written on the politics of Islamophobia and women in Islam. The title of her presentation is Our Universal or Theirs, Race, Gender and Civil Society in Late Capitalism. Tithi, I'll hand over to you, please take it away. Thanks so much, Peter. I want to start by um, thanking the uh, TNI, the Transnational Institute, the Havens Rights Center, and in particular, uh, Patrick Barrett for inviting me uh, to this wonderful conference. And I'm so looking forward to learning from <clears throat> the panels uh, tomorrow, as well as from my uh, co-panelists today. Um, I'm going to start um, briefly uh, talking about the um, scope of this paper and just as, as a forewarning as well that the paper is, I'm trying to present a very long paper in a very abbreviated form. So I'm really looking forward to your questions and comments uh, so that it may uh, go into further drafting of these ideas. So the title as Peter uh, said was our universal or theirs, race, gender, and civil society in late capitalism. On August 8th, 1920, at the height of the Jim Crow era, the New York Times published a review of W.E.B. Du Bois's Dark Water, Voices from Within the Veil. <clears throat> a certain weakness, I quote, in Professor Du Bois's reasoning, wrote the reviewer, is, I quote again, his intense concentration on one subject leads him to turn general universal wrongs into special Negro wrongs. The error runs all through his book and disfigures it, unquote. The paper of records view on universality is instructive for our purposes. I want to draw attention to the contrastive relationship the reviewer offers between, quote, special Negro wrongs and the universal. Particularly, I want to focus attention on the qualifier special. Special was the adjective widely used, even on the left, to characterize gender and racial oppression under capitalism. 
and there are several footnotes that follow this claim. This framing shared by left and liberals alike has two implicit claims. First, that capitalism has certain universalizing eff effects upon the working class as a whole, presumably related to the nature and culture of the work performed from which uh, surplus value is extracted. And secondly, that at tandem with this universalized experience of exploitation, certain groups within the working class, women, racialized and ethnicized people, are specially oppressed. Depending on your political view, the struggles of the specially oppressed had three pathways open to them. First, they were to be championed by the class as a whole. Second, they had to wait till the universal demands had been met. Or third, in the process of fighting for the universal demands, the needs of the specially oppressed would be met automatically. So these were the three sort of strategic conclusions um, that often um, relied on this framework. In this paper, I want to explore and yes, challenge this understanding of the universal and relatedly the place of the so-called special oppressions within it. Due to the constraints of time, I want to offer here three components of my argument and I hope we can elaborate on them further in the question and answer uh, section. First, I discuss the nature of the universal as it appears to us under capitalism. Second, I contend whether race and gender are indeed special oppressions. And finally, I raise some strategic questions about how a new generation of left can orient to capitalism's current predations. So our universal or theirs. I take as my starting point in interrogating the universal, Marx's designation of the proletariat as a, I quote, class in, civ in civil society that is not of civil society. Marx closely following Hegel demarcates as civil society all social activity that occurs outside the purview of the state, institutions of education, health, the law uh, and jurisprudence of a country, religion and vo voluntary associations all form constitutive elements of civil society. And this civil society functions primarily with the individual as its operating unit. At the outset, in Marx then, we recognize that the reason the working class belongs in this civil society but is not of it is because all its institutions claim a generality that masks the interests of a particular class, namely the bourgeoisie. Further, that bourgeois civil society is alienated and this alienation is rooted in the very workings of the capitalist economy that sustains it. This definition of civil society then forces us to examine any universality that arises from its terrain. Marx urges us to be suspicious of all its normative claims for such claims must necessarily rely on exclusionary principles. Only bourgeois civil society can produce general or universal claims to human equality from a slaveholder. It is not so much a contradiction as a constitutive feature of the project. Bourgeois law can thus simply embody this false or what I call surface universality without needing to provide substantive protection to the oppressed. I'll give you an example from India. Several laws in, exist in the books to prevent caste violence against lower caste people with strong punishments for their infraction. The Untouchability Offenses Act of 1955, Protection of Civil Rights Act 76, Scheduled Castes and Scheduled Tribes, um, Prevention of Atrocities Acts 89. You can see they were enacted at different periods of um, independent India, were all created for this purpose. But predictably, their existence does not guarantee their enforcement. 
even the most radical of them cannot protect the rights of Dalits precisely because the power of the upper castes is embedded in social and economic relations. And the state and civil society institutions exist not to challenge that power, but to organize it. And this same format or framework can be applied for race um, and racial uh, uh, and laws um, um, uh, existing in uh, places like the US and UK against racial oppression. So are these special oppressions or integrative oppressions? This is my second uh, claim to my argument. If we question the very premise of the universal as claimed by bourgeois civil society, one that advocates for general laws benefiting a fictitious all, then we can begin to unpack the true nature of this general. Are race and gender general conditions of capitalism or its special exceptions? There is a liberal as well as a social democratic stake to the answer. Can we theoretically reject the liberal claim that all lives matter during a BLM uprising and still argue that race neutral or universal social programs can ameliorate the injuries of race? We must begin from the premise we set out in the earlier section that capitalism is dehumanizing to the proletariat and any universal claims that arises from or aligns to this first and surface approximation of bourgeois civil society misses the point. But what are the mechanisms through which capitalism dehumanizes workers? My answer here relies on social reproduction theory rather than previous interpretive frameworks of special oppressions to understand the logic of capital accumulation. Capital accumulation and the reproduction of capital must be an uninterrupted process. And in order for it to be so, capital needs stable and reliable networks of political institutions and social relations to maintain its condition of possibility on an ongoing basis. Race and gender, broadly understood, I argue, provide these conditions of possibility for la wage labor, private property, and accumulation. In its continued search to increase surplus value, capitalism must necessarily look to go beyond the point of production and simultaneously create and rely upon multiple forms of social control that cheapen its costs. Many scholars, for instance, have shown how wages are often a small proportion of a family's income to sustain daily life reproduction, while subsistence activities and access to public services are equally, if not often more, important. Race and gender shape the nature of both such unpaid subsistence work, as well as access to government resources, thereby socially reproducing some sections of the working class as more abject than others. The unnatural moment of this current pandemic, for instance, has revealed tragically the racialized inequalities that are naturally part of capitalist daily life. Black and brown communities were disproportionately affected by the virus, not because they were specially oppressed, but because general conditions of wage work, housing, healthcare, and placement of pollutant industries in their neighborhoods produce these communities as more vulnerable. In other words, their social reproduction as black and brown workers were done through legal and general mechanisms of capital accumulation. Recently, Michael Goldfield in his study of Southern labor has brilliantly shown how Southern discriminatory policies such as segregation of education and racialized limits on federal benefits were actually nationalized, making segregation, as Goldfield calls it, as widespread as possible in the North, not just in the South. So if this is their universal, how do we define our own? First, we must recognize that any universal that we aspire to under capitalism 
must be necessarily incomplete. Since the inequalities and hierarchies that capitalism create are always mutable, any universal that aspires to transcend them must be constantly energized through the aspiration of existing struggles against them. Our universal must thus be tethered to concrete social struggles in order to earn its abstraction. Second, while it is true that our universal is always imminent in the false universal of bourgeois civil society, this does not mean that its horizons can be limited to civil society alone. To be an anti-capitalist in today's world cannot be limited to protesting this or that capitalist policy, but must include and sustained attack upon the very logic of accumulation. Challenging the creation of differential abjection of different sections of the working class will be ineffective if such challenges are limited to the labor market alone, because this production of the working class actually happens before the worker even reaches the, the labor market. So we must challenge the very logic of such production. Capital deems that the working class, as the Atlantic labor history, historian Peter Leinbau has said on many occasions and quoted by Robin Blackburn, uh, the working class I quote, occupies many different locations. Sometimes they're at work, sometimes they're at home, sometimes they're in jail, and sometimes they're, dr they're drunk lying in a gutter, unquote. If jails and workplaces are both part of capitalist totality, and moreover, as we argue, are dependent on each other for their conditions of possibility, then there is no reason to separate out a demand of Medicare for all in the US context from a demand for defunding the police. Both point to expanding the horizons of our universality. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tithi. That was fantastic. Really interesting uh, way to start this panel. So moving on now to a different region of the world, we now turn to Lillian Celiberti and Gina Vargas, who have co-authored a paper together. So I'll first introduce Gina. Uh, Gina is a prominent social scientist and feminist activist. For more than four decades, she has pushed for reproductive rights in Latin America, being recognized internationally as a leading women's rights scholar and campaigner. And she was the Latin American and Caribbean NGO coordinator for the NGO forum during the United Nations Fourth World Conference uh, on Women in Beijing in September, 1995. In 2001, she joined the World Social For uh, Forum's International Committee. And the other co-author is Liliane uh, Celiberti, who's a feminist environmental activist. She was a political prisoner under her country's military dictatorship between 1973 and 1985. She's a founding member and coordinator of the collective uh, Cotidiano Mujer, and she is also a member of Articulación Feminista Mercosur, which promotes the development of a feminist political platform at the Latin American and global levels. So I'll now hand over to both of you. Good afternoon to everybody. First, I'd like to say that it's very exciting um, to see the subject of this conference. The initial proposal uh, led us to long conversations with Hina, exactly in the production of an interesting work, and because it forms part of the debates that are planted here. I'm going to make some connections with the first session, but because time is short, I'm going to focus on what I had thought of originally. First, the first point I'd like to suggest is the necessity of imagining new forms of subjectification, without which it is not possible to think new imaginaries that are emancipatory. This involves both theory and practice and presupposes confrontations, questionings, and debates that allow 
us to deploy those subjectivities. In the case of Latin America, it necessarily requires parting, starting from the analysis of what we have lived during the last 15 to 20 years, of all the frustrated hopes, the teachings, and also the things that we've learned along the way. The trajectory, feminist trajectory, have faced the party leftism since the, the beginnings of the 80s in the case of Latin America. Um, having debates on radical dimensions of liberty and justice and opening new perspectives, theoretical and symbolic perspectives. When leftist parties arrived in government in all of their diversity, plurality, some more, some less leftist, because that also needs to be said, within the category of pro progressive. Many of the projections that were very hopeful were seen frustrated because of the impulse given to neo-developmentalist and extractivist aid uh, plans. The anti-capitalist ideals were substituted by the best practices of capitalist management in the best of cases but always oriented towards the paradigm, paradigm of growth located as a condition for the redistribution, redistribution of rent. This logic has not allowed us to distinguish between the economic proposals of the left from the depredatory and uh, pro proposals of predatory capitalism in its latest neoliberal incarnation. Making a critical balance of the decade of progressive governments in the region would be an urgent task for parties who aim to represent the collective interests of emancipation. This is the first challenge for analysis because our first question is, did these parties really or those who are actually there as parties, something which Daniel spoke of in referring to the field of left in Latin America that ranges from a radical right, which self-identifies as left, in the sphere of the Sao Paulo Forum, as the party of Ortega, that government for us is of the right, absolutely, with all of its anti-feminist proposals included. So, of course, the first is, do they really seek to represent an eman emancipatory proposal, or do they want to differentiate themselves from a not necessarily leftist agenda? And I mean, Foro de Sao Paulo and all that that represents for those who listen to us and don't know the region well, the Forum of Sao Paulo is a forum of leftist parties who has you know, maintained themselves along the years, especially in the period of progressive governments. To work towards a new horizon, capitalism has disappeared from the discourses of many of the leftist parties substituted by new discourses of justice, redistribution, human rights, and all that until there. Let's think about the situation of Chile and so on. One of the things we could talk about as Boaventura de Sousa Santos has defined it, is the crisis of the critical nouns. We've stopped talking about socialism, communism, and other, um, other nouns, anti-racism, anti-patriarchy, that has not conformed neither anti-racism nor anti-patriarchal as the horizon of the leftist progressive parties in Latin America. To open a debate requires, from this perspective, 
exploring the deepest roots of the deficits, the epistemological deficits, cultural and political deficits in the Latin American lefts to trace and map the discursive changes and the new horizons can help us identify new courses for social struggles. And here I want to make a distinction because I think the anti-capitalist struggle, the anti-racist struggle and the anti-patriarchal struggle is located in the horizon of social movement and not necessarily on the horizon of progressive parties. So here, we are witnessing a differentiation between a social field that has not only discursively, but also in their practices of struggle, has content, anti-racist and anti-patriarchal uh, discourses with an enormous impact on society and with changes in the social imaginaries. And we're witnessing a distancing between what is institutionalized politics of parties and the practices of these social movements that are dispersed, plural, diverse, with all the characteristics that they possess. In a way, this task before us has the challenge of broadening the epistemic field as Escobar has planted in the social, but also in what we have traditionally considered critical thought. Escobar proposes that we include alongside leftist thought, at least two other axes that emerge from the struggle and the thought from below and the self-identification thinking and the thinking from the earth. From the feminist movements, it's important to incorporate a critical dimension that is fundamental for thinking the emancipation, which is thinking from the body, from subjectivity, from the relations of power that cross it, from the autonomy that art articulates the interdependence of other bodies that require care and that are eco-dependent upon nature. The majority of feminist trends identify with a leftist field, which is always in solidarity, but also with a struggle with these parties. These are political practices with the left under their skin, as Paul Preciado says, and it's a radicality. The radicality of the feminist proposal overwhelms politics understood as a system of parties, and in particularly, of the alliances of leftist progressives. I don't think I have much time left, so I would like to say two more things that I think are central. One is the dimension acquired in the reflection by the left um, that care assumes as a social ethic that is collective and that has to do with the interdependency of humans, but also eco-dependency with nature. From uh, feminist economics, from a lot of field ranging from feminist and urbanism and ecology and all these different disciplinary spheres, feminists have created paradigms which are fundamental for thinking these dimensions that occupy a socialist uh, democratic socialism, because plurality is for the multiple feminisms an almost central composition of these struggles, because each subject that intervenes in struggles appears in new subjectivities that interpolate and change other subjectivities. And so I wanted to end with that and to not take up much more time and to leave more points for debate, especially with the eco-socialist pact uh, referred to by Daniel in the first stage that I will think about from the perspective of Latin America. Thank you. Thanks so much. And now, Hina? I'm very happy to be here. Thank you to Daniel.
and to everybody, all our friends out there. And it's very interesting, the importance of these reflections. Lilian has located the importance of the power of feminism and what we're trying to do here. I would just like to say one little thing in relation to the relation of leftist parties in Latin America and social movement. I think that our efforts, the efforts of cooptation, instead of a horizontal relation that could strengthen both, both actors, has been lacking. I want to complement what has been said by analyzing the potential of this new moment by taking a brief look at Antonio Gramsci's thoughts, who has already been named, basically on hegemony as an expression of a new collective will, which is beginning to emerge in this moment of deep, um, the deep crisis of paradigms now accentuated by the global pandemic. As a moment of interregnum, as Gramsci says, where the old does no, no longer responds to the vital demands of humanity and the new in its infancy is has not been finished being born, but it's definitely there. Hegemony is an integrating concept of politics, which entails a radical change in economics, in politics, culture, in practice, but also in its institutions and its horizons of change. A new hegemony for Gramsci develops when the subaltern classes, several of them now, develop their own conception of the world, achieving the active consensus of other classes of society, and a change in the coordinates of the social imaginary. From this Gramscian perspective, politics is not an activity located only in political society, which is what I'm very interested in highlighting, nor in the conquest of institutional power, something that our leftist has achieved and focused on the state centrism, forgetting the other dimensions. On the contrary, politics extends to anything that seeks to transform the relations of society with its institutions and to build a thought that disputes hegemony, the dominant capitalist hegemony. That is, before any economic or political direction, it is a cultural and moral direction. Before the seizure of power, Gramsci says that it is absolutely necessary to expand this kind of cultural hegemony and moral hegemony. The hegemony impulses us is thought of as a connection, not subordination, which requires a new horizon of power that is not vanguardist or hierarchical or excluding inequalities considered less relevant, as Titi was saying later, uh, earlier. It requires micropolitics that create fissures in the dominant subjectivity. This also complicates the conception of the emancipatory subject to open it up to the pluralism of subjects, a pluralism that is central, a central dimension in the construction of hegemony. It also contributes to a different version, vision of uh, democracy. For Gramsci, according to Leonor Arkfuch, socialism is not the future of democracy, but rather democracy is the future of socialism. It is undoubtedly a revolution, but it is not an assault on power. The concept of revolution in this perspective contains a process of laborious gestation and not a single event with a content of radical transformation that isn't limited to political power and the relations of production, but also to the rupture of each and every one of the relations marked by oppression and inequality that has coordinates that are economic, ethnic, religious, gendered, and everything else that facilitates um, hegemonic domination. This loss of hegemony is not absolute. We're undoubtedly facing a civilizational crisis, which is creating a deep uh, criticism of the productivist, predatory, exploitative, patriarchal, and racist model. But despite this crisis, its vision of the world, which is Eurocentric, ethnocentric, racist, patriarchal, continues to be relevant in the referential horizons of societies and also of movements and forces of change. 
In the face of this, the dispute for recognition of other perspectives and cosmic visions, it begins to be more central. I think of hegemony in its cultural dimension for a change in the common sense of the dominant perspective in all of its excluding dimensions and logics of domination. I want with this now to talk about what I consider or that we as a plurality consider, which is the counter-hegemonic turns as kind of clues for the prefiguration of a new hegemony. The signs and the tendencies that are beginning to emerge in different levels that are not isolated expressions but a fundamental part of the structural character of um, domination and which constitute the hegemony of capitalism. Sorry. Okay, the new hegemony begins to emerge with the referential horizons that have already been created in practice. This aspiration for a new hegemony is based on a critical look at traditional forms of doing politics, emphasizing economic justice, while at the same addressing new issues such as subjectivity, body, difference, and the politicization of everyday life that Lilian has sp spoken of. Managing diversity is the enormous political challenge contained in these new paradigms under construction and a permanent evaluation of how alternatives um, we are embodying. What is new in this complex process? If the eruption of feminisms in the 20th century implied a profound epistemic disobedience, politicizing women's discontent in the private sphere, and generating new categories of analysis and non-patriarchal ways of questioning reality. Today, from a multiplicity of struggles and resistances, a radical epistemic disobedience has opened up again, which recovers new imaginaries, making complex and enriching not only the reference horizons of feminism, but also impacting the dominant vision of the world, the contents of academy, of daily life and politics. Breaking the monopoly of knowledge produced from a single source, uh, demonstrating the close relationship between knowledge and power, evidencing its contribution to the plural content of hegemony. This is what Silvia Marcos, a fem Mexican feminist, has called the insurrection of subjugated knowledge, those who recover invisibilized forms of enunciation, although their historical value is powerful. And at the present time, are beginning to eliminate other forms and places of existence and confronting the epistemic violence that has historically kept them subordinate. For Latin America, this process has a long history. The Zapatista revolution was undoubtedly an impulse to recover experiences and cosmovisions that in belonging, in affirming their belonging to a different perspective um, are making more complex and opening other, up other forms of transformation, which connect and subvert univocal understandings, and from there recover new kinds of understanding. This is not only the recovery of central dimensions of the indigenous cosmovisions, such as good living, Ubuntu, Swahili, and other indigenous groups, it's all to the affirmation of the right to self-identify, which generates other kinds of geopolitical keys, rejecting categories seen as imposed and finding others that give account of the reality that has been denied and that express the political and epistemological positions. For example, this is the use of Abya Yala, which means a mature, flourishing land in the Quiche language. That's by the indigenous movements. Or Amefricanity, an expression of Afro-Latin feminisms, um, which is a different geopolitical perspective to that which the colonizers defined the constitution of Latin America. Added to this are the demands to black and indigenize, transsexualize the feminist agendas from an inclusion that is counter-hegemonic and to give account of the diverse um, subtleties that unfold 
and give clear evidence of the pluricultural, plurisexual, and multi-ethnic character of our region. A central dimension of the analysis and feminist struggle in Latin America and the world has been the recognition of the rights of the body, which is something that Lilia has spoken of, a transgressive dimension, which in positioning the sexual and reproductive rights of women and sexual dissidents, uh, the right to decide over our own bodies, including abortion, as well as to a right to a life without violence, without hunger, without racism. Today's recognition of the body that is political, subversive questioning um, has infinitely expanded its meaning in becoming a core of meaning for the all the different subtleties that feed um, feminism. For example, indigenous feminisms contribute to this transgression by offering a look at the body from other places of enunciation and resistance and greatly enriching its scope. The slogan, our body, earth, territory, expresses the way through which indigenous women appropriate, transform, and give greater meaning to the struggle for the rights of the body and for the defense of territory, which is dramatically threatened by dispossession, extractivism, and forced migration. A phrase from one of their posters summarizes this process. Patriarchy does to our bodies what extractive economies do to our territories. There are many more searches for solidarity and alternative economies, for feminist economists, uh, to recover ancestral practices such as buen vivir, etc. All of this expands the horizon of struggles and permanent permanently expands the spaces of resistance. These processes also make more complex the categories of analysis. How can we continue to advance in the understanding of experiences, cosmovisions that are different and unequal in their form of recognition by the quotas of power that they entail without their denying their contradictions? On the one hand, the category of intersectionality, which gives name to this panel, um, intersectionality that is political, requires a deconstruction of the contents of power that these intersections entail. This also allows us to advance in the construction of dialogue, cultural exchanges that are not only deploying interested knowledge in dialogue and the encounter of different worldviews, but also, as Catherine Walsh says, to position it as an epistemic interculturality whose orientation is to analyze the place occupied by our knowledge, knowledge and the assumptions from which they start. In short, to recover the conflictivity of differences in order to deconstruct the power relations they entail. In all of this, there are subjectivities marked by historical processes of exclusion and privilege. Vilma Piedade, an Afro-Brazilian feminist, provides a way of speaking from the pain of subordination, the word doloridad, a term for speaking from the shadows, for being a word silenced inside and outside of us. It is a pain provoked in all women by machismo, Vilma says. However, when it comes to us, Black women, there is an, ag an intensification of that pain, which is the pain caused by racism. And that pain is black. That is where race comes in. That is where gender and class comes in. This look, um, there is a demand to articulate race, class, and gender, but not a simple articulation, but rather a dispute for recognition, for a deconstruction of the power that each of these reality brings within and between themselves and with other women. From this perspective, the category of doloridad, which becomes an epistemic category, is a discovery of the way in which women, from their experiences, memories, their cosmovisions, outline their ways of being subjects, their ways of recognition, and their ways of disputing power. Finally, to build hegemony is also to connect with the different existing gazes and worldviews 
the cosmovisions and to establish conceptual bridges to conflict and dialogue to think and feel the moment and the, its possible horizons, giving greater complexity and perspective of interculturality, require new questions from which we need new cognitive maps that avoid assuming the certainty of the given to connect to a consciousness of unfinishedness, a knowledge from the threshold says Hugo Semelman, and that recovers not only the rational cognitive, but as many of you have said, also the effective the imaginaries. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, a really wonderful way to start the discussion, and I'm looking forward to hearing from some more people now. So there are two ways to contribute. You can post a question to the Q&A, that is a button located uh, in the toolbar at the bottom, and you can write in a question there. And if you are a conference panelist, that is to say that you're going to be speaking uh, at some point uh, during the week, then you can switch your video on and raise your hand and I will see you. And I've already got one person indicated to speak. That's Constanza. So I'll bring you in first. And anyone else that would like to come in, please get my attention or, as I say, post a question in the Q&A and I will read that out for you. Bueno, lo primero es eh, agradecerles, agradecerles no solo a los organizadores del oh, seminario. The first thing is to thank you, thank you, the seminary organizers, eh, also super this panel for a much needed con mucha centralidad, además, discussion with a lot of centrality. Added with the first sessions, and you really deserve it. My question is para Lilian y para Gina. For Lilian and Gina, de lo que dice Gina I que take a starting point what Gina has said that we need a concept of politi politics that transcends the party politics and its institutionality. Can you hear me okay? Transcending formal institutional politics, I'm completely in agreement. Politics is a lot of things in the sphere of the public cannot be reduced to political parties as much as they may have the monopoly on political representation. There are a lot of interesting experiences in Latin America of cooperatives of coordinated efforts. We have the green tie for those who know the Argentinian case, the depenalization of abortion, also in Uruguay. Without the feminist movement, that would have never happened. And it required an articulation of the feminism of social movements and the party feminism. Liliana and I have been together in that struggle. So I'm referring to something that is for us, Entonces, our daily life. No este so to not go further in, on the divorce between party politics and the movements, thinking about how to transcend the pragmatism the capitalism that has predominated within governments. The question is, what are the best practices I hate that word, but oh well, I used it anyway, <laughs> with all of its charge. What are the best experiences that you guys have seen of articulation between the feminist movement and the progressive political parties? The darkest experiences, some of have already been mentioned, Nicaragua is clearly one of those, the separation. Pero creo que hay experiencias buenas, recandables. Entonces, proximity with the right. But I do think there are uh, great experiences in, of thinking politics in a broad sense, of connecting formal politics with the social movements and learning from the good things that have happened in Latin America in sexual and reproductive rights. It's true that there's been some cooptation, but there's also been a lot of impact of women on politics greater participation of women in politics. And the second no question primera, es que doesn't have anything to do with the first, but there are also social movements that are very patriarchal that have assumed increasing importance 
Specifically, the neo-Pentecostal churches in Latin America have promoted politics uh, in Brazil, but even in more secular states like Uruguay. And that's also the construction of subjectivities. And that's also hegemonic construction. And that exists and it's expanded in resistance to us, to feminism and has had an articulation with politics. And part of the conservative resurgence has to do with that confessional model. And we also have to think about how the Pope has intervened in the debate, our progressive Pope on the uh, debates on abortion. So what do we do with this? Because this is also going on. Thank you. Thanks very much, Constanza. So what I'm going to do now is, because I mean, most of those questions were uh, directed towards Gina and Lilian, but also I think some of them bear on uh, like the debate in the US uh, and Europe as well. So I'm going to bring in all three of the panellists. But first, I'm just going to refer to a couple of questions asked uh, from some of the attendees of the conference, and then I'll bring all three of you back in to comment on all of it, if, if that's okay. So the first question is specifically for Tithi. It's from uh, Estefania uh, Cordova. Uh, and she asks, Tithi, how do you think this pandemic will transport, transform the misnamed special oppression? For example, for a woman employed uh, as a worker in a factory and as the economic breadwinner of her family, how will her role be transformed within the social reproduction of life in general and for the accumulation of capital? And then there's, uh, one more question, this one from an, uh, 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 is without a name. Uh, can you give more details about the epistemic violence and what would feminist epistemic disobedience, what would that look like? So I'm not sure who would like to come in first. Um, perhaps Lilian? Great. In relation to the question made by Constanza, of course, there are a lot of experiences, a lot of experiences of articulation um, that are powerful between social feminisms, collective mass feminism that express themselves on the street and the feminisms that are in politics. I think of now the campaign that is being undertaken by feminists, autonomous feminists, to make uh, reforms to the new constitution of Chile that were protagonists of the uprisings and that questioned within those uprisings the, space, the social spaces that were traditional, as Constanza was saying, not the fundamentalists, but our internal spaces, in campo, those that uh, have been identified with the left, but that have practices that are absolutely antiquated of political apparatuses, of defi definition outside of the assembly. So all those feminisms that were present in the uprisings and that before that were present in the student uprisings and before that were among those denouncing the, the sexual violence of the professors in the universities. And so the accumulation of these movements that have a lot of years are now expressing themselves in saying, we want to be part of the changes to the constitution. We want to help define the new constitution. In terms of the epistemic violence, what I referred to is that the structure of the parties, not our friends, but the structures of the parties of the left, continue considering a dimension. They don't have an integrated dimension of the emancipatory perspective from the perspective of feminist subjectivity in the sense of subjectivity based on the sustainability of life, which goes beyond feminism, because in reality, maintaining life under capitalism is connected to practices. This was something talked about in the first panel, 
um, about, regarding constructing from below, which is something that God said. A politics constructed from below appears as a dimension of valorization of the mic micropolitics as a central element in politics. Micropolitics in the sense of building, of community, in, in the neighborhoods, in the places where we are, where these intersections of anti-racism, anti-patriarchy, of sexual diversity, of new forms of work, of consumption, especially of consumption, question capitalism. I think that we're still far from arriving to that practice. The pandemic today has brought us work to our own homes. And much more critical, the dimension of sustainability of life, particularly for women that, ha that are responsible, continue to be responsible for care. So something has already been said, or Lilian said it, a repetir, pero sí I will, of course, not repetir, repeat it, but I do want to emphasize con el, that what el, we have gained con el ha sido in relation to the state has been because in many of the cases there have been feminists present o sea, within parties and with the state. Really, many of us, we've been militants within the party. The party. A... I consider myself a leftist and I will Quizá. never leave the horizon of the left. Not the left as we're living it now. So I think one of the problems of the left has been the concentration and prioritizing its gaze upon the state. I think that there's a dimension of construction of counter hegemony that has been left aside, and that's why I talk about you know Gramsci. As the feminist friend of ours said. A demand does not arrive to the state because of its dramatism, because then all our agendas would be there, but because of our capacity of reaching broader publics. And the only way to reach broader publics is really uh, working from our quotidian life, from our daily life. And that doesn't necessarily has to do with the claro, specific demands hacerlo. made upon the state, which of course is something we have to do. Absolutely. I'm not denying that. Pero primero, and this tratemos, state is very important. Tratemos, but first, tratemos, let's think about what kind momento, of state we want in this no, moment por, por that capital, continues no? to be dominated by capitalism and neoliberalism. Creo que la otra, este, el, the other thing, este, sí, los movimientos sociales super patriarcales, on patriarchal social movements, Precisely because we need some advances on that front. And there's a dispute, there's a struggle, and it is serious because it is incredible how Bolsonaro continues having support, how Trump has 78 million people supporting him in his madness. And so there is a deformation that has been very complicated. And we need to look into that. It's very strange, or rather, we'd need to think about why it is that in places like Brazil, where there was so much advances in, in the affirmation of the Workers' Party, is now this fascist proposal, like, shameless, um, exists. And I do think that there's some challenges. We need to consider the challenges of what happened in Bolivia was only the product of our right. Well, it was also the product of the lack of political perspective, first of having different kind of leadership, that leadership rotated, the second, not calling for a referendum, and then, oh, I lost it, I'm going to another one. I mean, what are we talking about? It's not that I'm defending a bourgeois democracy, but democracy needs to be recaptured by us, because really the cooptation of democracy is terrible. One more small thing, the epistemic violence. Here, I think it's kind of what Titi was saying, and I think which happens everywhere in India and everywhere else. Sectors, fundamental sectors of society, which have other culture, other cosmovision, 
and which have not been recognized have been thought as a folk or something that is not really knowledge in exchange in other places. The affirmation that, that it's, or rather, experience produces knowledge and our experiences produces a rebel knowledge. The diso epistemic disobedience is saying, I don't believe in what you're saying. Your epistemologies are no good for me. And we have to negotiate on those fronts. And that's why we're talking about the importance of recognizing conflict. Because it's not just like, oh, let's all get together. We'll all be happy. No, there's struggles of power. There's hierarchical struggles. And there are problems. Some women are more citizens than other women. Not even to speak of women and men. And so I think those are the challenges in this moment that we need to think about in our societies, you know, beyond everything that was spoken of in the, in the beginning on the limitations and potentials that capitalism continues to have. That to me are the processes that are most important. I think for the pandemic, there's a series of dimensions that are emerging with a lot of force. The sense of lack of dignity, of anger for the brutal forms through which all human rights are being trampled, I think it leads to a new sensibility that is important in this moment. Thanks very much. Just before I bring you in, I'll just say quickly uh, that I haven't actually received any more questions in the Q&A. So if you ask a question, you'll be the first to get in. Uh, so just encouraging everyone to, to do that. Do they? Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks for that um, question on <clears throat> the pandemic and uh, special oppression. So I just want to clarify um, that just to go back to what I argued that I, I consider special oppressions such as race and gender, so-called social special oppressions, as part of the general operations of capitalism, right? So I, I see race and gender not to be externally con connected to capitalism, but actually internally connected and co-produced alongside of and other um, uh, uh, processes of capital uh, accumulation. So that's that's so the the production of difference is actually a general process for for capital and is integral to it. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, exploitation and extraction of surplus value can only take place because of these background possibilities that make make such uh, extraction smoother, more reliable, and often uh, expands uh, it, it, its its value. So that having said, uh, let's go back to your question about the pandemic and social oppression. So I think um, you know. The following social reproduction theory, I think I want to make a distinction between what the standard Marxist account is that human beings need to satisfy, as human beings, we need to satisfy our needs within a system of production, right? So that's, that's one definition, but I want to give that definition uh, more flesh and um, in this, and, and in, uh, and I can do so by actually going back to Marx. So I want to say it's not just a question of satisfaction of needs in a weak sense, but the process of life making in a strong sense. So in a much more expansive way of satisfaction of needs. So not just food, shelter and um, housing, as it were. So but we're talking about huma human beings in order to live need the satisfaction of their needs in a much more expansive way. And those needs actually themselves expand um, uh, uh, historically and uh, depending on the pace of struggle. So I think one of the things the pandemic ha has revealed is that while on the weak version definition of satisfaction of need, we depend on our wage because the pandemic caused mass unemployment and a dependence on 
certain kinds of labor as essential, it revealed the actual character of the wage form, right? So for instance, when, uh, when governments made a list of what was essential work, uh, we did not see any stockbrokers on that essential list. We saw instead uh, food production workers, nurses, teachers, garbage uh, collectors, and so on as essential work. So in a way, it, it revealed, the pandemic revealed what capitalism under normal circumstances keep concealed, which is what kind of work sustains society, right? So that was one, one thing. The other is it also revealed that the wage, as I said, is only a weak form in which we satisfy our needs, right? So in order to satisfy our needs and live as full human beings, we need all of these other social relations, which actually became essential during the pandemic. So I, I um I think Hina and, and others have talked about these various communities sustained by love and solidarity that became in a way fundamental to uh, our existence during this pandemic because other institutions fell away so rapidly, right? So, um, so I want to go back to what happens then to perceptions of special oppression under pandemic, which was your original question. And I don't really think that perceptions of race and gender um, can alter in any policy uh, making way, even though the pandemic reveals these things, these essential truths about our society. That kind of change to affect policy needs mass struggles from below. So even though we recognize that women's labor, especially black women's labor sustained US society, made it possible for US society to exist, not the labor of you know, the Trump family, but that recognition of that labor as a policy will not come from that understanding. That has to be won through mass struggles. So again, to go back to your question, does the perception of special oppression, uh, does it get altered by the pandemic? The answer is yes and no. We have a greater understanding perhaps, a more generalized understanding of the essential nature of women slaver, particularly the labor of women of color. But in order to make that perception actually a social reality and to gain something out of it, we need mass struggles from below. So I have one more question in the Q&A. And again, uh, a call for any other conference panelists if they'd like to come in and join the discussion, that'd be fantastic. But in the meantime, I'll ask this one question. And this is from Damien McElroy. And he asks, can the politics of a radical and emancipatory transition to a global post-capitalist, post-carbon future act as a new universal overarching lens through which we can reinterpret the intersectional necessity of democratic socialist struggle. Did all of you get that? Would any of you like to come in on this? And just before I bring you back in, all of you raised really interesting points in that last part of the discussion. And I'd encourage all the uh, conference attendees to check out the rest of the program because there's gonna be some specific panels really engaging with certain aspects uh, of the things raised. For example, Hina was talking about the questions of the state and thinking about the type of state that we actually want to build. And uh, in session nine, which is on Friday, the first session on Friday, it's gonna be very directly about that question. So um, I think that, all, a lot of the themes that have been raised today really intersect nicely uh, with some of the other discussions we'll be having throughout the week. Uh, but yes, would any of you like to come back on that question? Hina, I, I think you were uh, about to start speaking, or Lilian, go ahead. Uh, so muy, muy, muy a, a titul, di, titulares, este, pero que tiene que ver de Just alguna manera... briefly, um, there is something relating to epistemic violence in its deepest expression. When we're talking, for example, on the need to think of the ecological perspective with the feminist perspective, with the anti-racist perspective, 
as part of, I think Hina was saying it, um, speaking of intersectionality, it's a concept that is to, requires a lot of, oh, thinking of intersectionality as just a place where different paths coincide is too simple, doesn't really reveal that the perspective that is simultaneously anti-racist, anti-patriarchal, uh, ecologically sustainable, in the sense of thinking our relationship with nature, with a new paradigm. So I think that still, the dim those dimensions in what relates to the debates of this conference are substantive because we have not advanced enough within the political left on, inter on the intersection of all of those dimensions. And therefore, on a new perspective that has to do with eradicating the concept of development, as Titi was saying, there are concepts that form part of capitalism. Development forms part of capitalism. It is a vision of capitalism. If we don't get out of development, then we're always going to be thinking of growth, of growth as an element that is foundational to sustain life. Leaving capitalism requires thinking other dimensions to maintaining life. And really what maintains life is community, is people, is women, is people. People survive in this world one in an incredible way. So I think it's good to, you know, take up these different debates, uh, especially in the last panel which will make that connection with the ecological, with the environmental dimension, which I think are really important to think about. Would any of you like to come in next, Tithi or Hina? I'll also add one other question in to you beyond the, the last one that I asked, uh, which is from Albana. And they asked, what would happen if the basic universal income would only be granted to women? So that's one other thing to think about. Hina, can I bring you in next? Sure. I mean, seeing, being feminist doesn't mean we're fighting just for women. There are justice issues that we need to get for everybody. However, evidently, in this pandemic, you know, although men and women have been displaced from their jobs or in situations that are very difficult, women are having a, an increased difficulty. 70% of women workers are informal, you know? So now they can't go out on the street anymore because there's a pandemic. They're in charge of their kids. They're in charge often of a man that currently doesn't have a job and so receives violence on that front. The level of violence in all the world during pande the pandemic has been brutal. Feminicide, um, sexual harassment, rape, especially of young minors. It's really brutal. And so I do think that there needs to be a gendered perspective in relation to, to the recognition of, you know, women's rights in, during the pandemic. The fact that women continue to be in charge of caretaking of domestic duties permanently you know, that requires, you know, thinking about this fundamentally. However, I insist this pandemic is leaving, is evidencing the weakest, most brutal um, truths about the exploitation and discrimination of women. But we need to think how the exit, how the solution, you know, includes these truths, how the, this is an opportunity to articulate all of these realities, recognizing really what are the specific rights of all the affected sectors. I want to uh, go back to the question of why I argue that it is the general uh, logic of capital that creates uh, differentiations of gender and race. Okay, so 
and and the question of the climate crisis is is a very important one to to understand. So I want to give two examples of the general logic of capital. One, you know, climate crisis is a generalized crisis that affects all humans, and yet the eighty uh, percent of climate refugees are women. Uh, and you know, to give a more um, a sort of na nation-based example, uh, more Black people in, in America are affected by uh, polluted industries being placed in their neighborhoods than white neighborhoods and white communities, right? So, so again, while the climate crisis is a general crisis, it is the general logic of capital that produces certain communities and certain uh, groups of people as more abject than others, right? So the, the production of difference is actually generalized. Um, so when, we t when, when you ask the question about whether a just transition can be a new universal horizon, you know, uh, the simple answer is, of course, yes. Uh, but there are two, um, I think that, that I would add two qualifiers to, to the yes. One is that a just transition as, as we normally understand it is not going to happen under capitalism. And that's the general logic of its accumulation that the transition to a just future for our planet cannot include capitalism in its mix. It has to be anti-capitalist because again, the general logic of capital is about producing surplus value in the, uh, in the interests of capital. And that has to be fast. It has to be competitive with other capitals, which requires by necessity fossil fuels or some other extractive thing to actually speed up production. Speeded up production is, is part of the general logic of capital. So none of these things can actually happen uh, within capitalism, okay? We cannot have capitalism function and yet have a healthy planet, right? So it has to be an anti-capitalist. Um, similarly, the other qualifier we must add is then our solutions cannot be from some kind of utopian future. Our solutions has to be forged in the here and now with the resources that we actually have, right? Um, and this, the, the fundamental thing that I have, we have to keep in mind constantly is the question of time. The time is running out for our planet as well as for the possibilities of not just uh, socialism or a socialist society, but the possibilities of a human survival in, in the question of, of the cl uh, climate crisis. So when we think about universal horizons, we have to keep those, um, uh, th those questions in mind. So while we struggle for reforms in the here and now, we must struggle for those reforms within an anti-capitalist horizon uh, constantly because uh, we cannot reform capitalism in order to save the planet, as it were. I've got Hillary, who's, uh, who'd like to come in now. So Hillary Wainwright. Yeah, it was a, another kind of question and in a way wanting to push um, Hina and um, Lillian a little bit um, on the basis of what they're talking about when they talk about knowledge, because I think that, that in a way the importance of what you're saying is even greater than than you're saying. <laughs> but, you know, you probably realise that, you know, that in a way, um, the whole sort of organisation of politics, including left politics, maybe even more left politics because of its focus on the state, is around a notion of knowledge, which is, you know, using the jargon, sort of positivistic. I mean, it's a, a sort of sci scientific idea of knowledge which precludes, I mean, not all science does, but the, this particular notion of science um, that precludes the, the importance of experience. And so politics is organized almost around that, or traditional politics organized around that sort of knowledge that can be codified and centralized. Whereas the women's movement 
you know, but not just the women's movement, has been about valuing that knowledge which, you know, we could call it tacit knowledge, knowledge which is evident in practice, in skills, in daily life. Um, and that, you know, if you, you have to completely reimagine politics, it's like turning it on its head um, to be able to take account of that kind of knowledge. <clears throat> but clearly, you know, um, the workers' movement too, in a way, the base of the workers' movement, the, the shop floor organisation, is also based on um, practical knowledge. <clears throat> and you could say that the very organisation of social movements is about socialising and sharing that practical knowledge so that it can become the basis of agency, but agency from below. So in a way, valuing this idea of practical knowledge, which is in a way, the women's movement I feel was the movement that first really made this a self-conscious process through consciousness raising groups, through making conscious the kind of knowledge embedded in emotion, <coughs> in experience, you know, knowledge dismissed as gossip conventionally, you know, was the first movement that really made the sharing of this practical tacit knowledge fundamental to its purposes. And so I'm kind of wanting you to explore what a politics, I mean, it builds on Constancia's question about the articulation of feminist politics in political parties, but it's almost saying that's more fundamental, that would require the complete transformation of political parties as we know them. And just to ask you, maybe Constancia too, to say something about, and Tithi too, about what that might mean. <laughs> a politics based on, on a, an appreciation of the knowledge of experience that comes from experience, rather than just the knowledge that can be codified and centralized. Sorry, I've got a, a, a hoarse throat. Not COVID, I don't think, I hope. Well, I'm, I'm glad it's not COVID, Hillary. Uh, and thanks for the fantastic question. Um, I've got a couple more questions, so I'll give you all uh, three questions and then I will invite you all to come back in. So Mike McCarthy has a question. Mike, do you want to come in with that? I actually can't hear you, Mike. In the meantime, while you get your mic sorted, I'll read out the other question. So this one's from Boyd Rossing. Uh, and he says that it seems to me that Lillian and Hina show a sophistication re, uh, regarding pluriversal subaltern epistemologies as central to societal transformations, whereas economy-focused presenters in both sessions, the previous session and this one, focused on political and economic analysis and models. Um, so can you say a little on the epistemological dimension and the centrality of the subaltern? Uh, I worry that strategies that operate without critical consideration of epistemological underpinnings are likely to perpetuate strategies that fail the deep social and ecological needs of today. Uh, so my question is, how do we effectively build the influence of subaltern perspectives in transformative work, especially uh, in the United States? Uh, so that's one question. And it seems that Mike is having a little bit of trouble with his microphone. So I'm just going to ask the question on his behalf because he sent it into the chat as well. And he says he's got a question for Tithi. How do we think about variation in the degree of special oppressions under capitalism? Uh, one thing that appears clear is that across place and time uh, is that production of difference happens differently in different capitalisms. So this suggests that we can't simply explain the production of difference from the general logic, that we need to also explain social difference uh, uh, fr from a more conjunctural basis. So I'm, com I'm curious about your thoughts here. Uh, so because um, uh, I've started with Liliana and Hina first, most times I'll, I'll ask Tithi to come in first this time. Is that okay? Yeah, uh, sorry, yeah, okay. Yeah, hey Mike, thanks for the question. Um, hope you're okay. Um, sorry, we can't hear you. Um, yes, so I completely agree with the uh, first part of the uh, question that um, uh, there is um, the production of difference happens differently uh, under different capitals, right? Und under different national capitals, absolutely. So uh, when I say that it, uh, when I say the general logic, um, I don't mean. Uh, I guess I, I need to clarify that uh, further. So. Um, 
the valorization of capital obviously needs um, uh, the creation of more and more surplus value. And uh, what I wanted to talk about as a um, general logic is that capital has the general logic to degrade uh, life uh, in order to lower the wages of the worker, right? And that de degradation creates or contributes to um, creating more and more value for capital. And that has to be not simply within the process of uh, exploitation uh, of surplus value through waged work, right? So now the question is not to me uh, that, you know, Dalits are oppressed in a different manner from uh, black folks in the United States or even uh, in, in South Africa. The question for me is the, uh, the, the similarity of the relationship between that kind of uh, oppression and the general social totality, uh, production of capitalist totality. So why does it have to be that there are certain forms of similarity in which Dalit oppression actually matches Black oppression in as far as capitalist logic of accumulation is concerned in the sense that both groups are, um, uh, uh, it, are produced uh, with differential abjection compared to uh, other sections of the class. So that's the general logic rather than that, you know, the cost and uh, race are the, uh, are the exact same thing. So absolutely there is differentiation in the way these oppressions are produced, but their relationship to the overall logic of capital is what I'm talking about as, as fundamental and integrative to the logic of accumulation. But we, I, we should talk more. Thanks. Uh, Lillian, do you want to come in next? Uh, sure. There are questions that are very complex to answer, you know, you know, a quick answer, but I wanted to refer to, in particular, to the Hillary's question or Hillary's comments that she made in relation to the experiences the practical experiences. In the first panel, you know, there was talk of the labor union crisis. And, I, you know, I coincide, not because of the major disaffiliation, but also because of the characteristics that labor has in this moment of capitalism and how um, that is clashes and encounters with other dimensions that threaten life, you know, the environmental dimensions. Let's think about the fact that one of the most significant forms of resistance in Latin America has been the face off with the mining companies. And that confronts, in a way, questions as dimensions of classic syndicalism or labor movement with movements that come from the social movements. Even though ecologists in Latin America don't have the greatest reputation um, or aren't considered a significant dimension because they question the deepest paradigm of growth, of capitalist growth. So what you were saying is that there are a lot of um, camps of experience that have to do with an interpolation of party system. And I return to the Chilean case. In Chile today, there are this kind of popular consultations because there was a feminist movement, a student movement, you know, who were on the first line, you know, that put their body on the street. There were 500 teenagers and young people without, you know, who lost their eye because that's what it costs. That's what this constitutional reform that's going to be voted on costs. And this dimension 
you know, put in crisis even leftist parties that within the system of parties sought to negotiate with this perverse system. So today, if there was a vote which included freelance um, and Mapuche population, it's because there was a struggle on the street because there was a struggle that cost lives, you know, because there were hundreds of women were raped by the police because teenagers and young people lost their eyes, etc. What I'm trying to say here is that the dimension of changes in politics, of the meaning of politics, even within leftist parties, cannot be achieved without radical disruptive confrontations. And I think the alliances are possible in circumstances, in special moments. There are moments when there are great abysses, and those abysses are real. That's why I'm talking about Chile, because there were moments where we witnessed the, the abyss, a chasm between those who said, we are not leaving the streets until they don't accept a reform to the constitution where, you know, there was a new constitution, etc. So there are moments when these practices, these are the practices that we need to rise up, that we need to interact, those of resistance to mining projects, to mining, to extractivism, that form part of the struggles that are very important in Latin America. And one last thing, I think that in Argentina and Uruguay, starting with the international women's strike of the 8th of March, um, there's been an interaction generated that's very powerful with the labor unions that transform because we're taking those debates to their rank and file. And of course, that generates a very active presence of um, labor union uh, feminists. And that's something new, even though I have, all, you know, over 35 years of, you know, doing militancy in both. And I created the first commission of women in the Workers Central. There is a form of dialogue that has been achieved on the base of not accepting certain rules that the left continues to have and continues to reproduce. When women say, no, enough, we don't want any more of this. We want an assembly. We want to talk. We want our words to be represented in the top. We don't want them to decide for us. That is a true transformation of politics, of politics in all of its senses, of the forms of doing politics. Okay, just adding a little more. I think to answer Hillary, I completely agree with you. Of course, it's a totally transgressive uh, way of recognizing the knowledge production. But I also think that there's two emphases that I want to highlight. The first is the tremendous difficulty of um, thinking, rational thinking, and but also within the left of leaving, you know, to the side, bodies, emotions, etc. There's a writer that's very interesting, Chilean and German, Lechner. He said, a politics that is not in charge or responsible of the hopes, fears, and suffering of the people is a politics that is insignificant because it can't be touched. So it is transgressive and in subversive. Of course, there is an, however, there's also another dimension of this knowledge, which is the knowledge of people uh, in Latin America, but also in other regions of the world, which is considering that that is not knowledge, that that is folk that is something uh, kind of outside of history or pre-modern with our perspective that we're having of the ways through which feminists and women 
of indigenous peoples and Afro uh, peoples and transsexual feminists are bringing forward is really a very different way of looking at the world. Something that's very fundamental is um, recuperating the struggle from, ter from the territory. That is a new category of analysis, which um, we have resistance, but also production of new forms of knowledge. So I think valuing these other experiences is absolutely fundamental. You know, it has led us to, for example, for me, you know, I'm atheist, but it's led me to recover certain forms of spirituality that we never even considered because we all thought that it was connected to, you know, the shackles of religions and evangelists and so on. But there's a spirituality that belongs to us and we have to see what we do with that. And that's been something that's been brought forward by the indigenous feminists, by the Zapatistas especially, you know, who have been an incredible source of um, teachings. In terms of recuperating epistemologies, uh, subaltern epistemologies, I think that it's a little bit what I was saying before. I think it's not that the subaltern doesn't exist. It's not that they don't have a voice, but rather that they are not listened. They do have a voice. And in the moment in which they begin to put their voice forward, then they, you know, they've been cast aside. So how to recover this voice? You know, it's been recovered a lot of ways. Black feminists um, in the North in their confrontation with white feminists have criticized and have talked about intersectionality precisely because of this. A Latin or Mexican woman such as Gloria Saldúa has spoken, has spoken about frontier feminism, front, feminisms that are outside of the centrality, and they are the ones that produce a kind of knowledge that's not in your face, but in your broader sensibility of where they're located. And so all these imag uh, imaginaries of, that I've tried to give of how these different things come together and create a language and a form of conceiving the world that is new with Afro-Americanidad, um, in the perspective of territory, I think all of these things are fundamental. The Zapatistas have gathered this sense of complementarity, a word that is often not used right. But one thing is the complementarity between a person and nature, and another thing is the complementarity between man and woman. And usually it's the man who you know, has the head in the complementarity. So what they say is, we talk, we walk side by side. And so we're talking about parody and there, you know, there's a lot of other dimensions that are present in that word. So a new generations are very important. They are recuperating some prior struggles. Um, and that's really important too. Here, we have a long struggle against the dictator Fukimori because of ster forced sterilization. So we're fighting every day. You know, imagine our surprise that three or four years ago, a group of, you know, teenagers, 17, 18 year olds came out dressed as if they had been forcefully sterilized. And with a sign that said, we are the granddaughters of the women that the of the women that you could not sterilize. So, you know, it's amazing. There's, you know, a way that they're drawing from private, previous struggles on their own territory that is very powerful. We've had a long struggle, you know, within the pandemic when there was a coup here, you know, decreed by the parliament and all the young people, you know, came out on the streets and the protests, you know, I didn't go out on the street because I'm older, but my my daughter forbade me from going out. But they said, mom, stay home. Us young people 
Y entonces eso me hace sentir de que realmente... ...are here taking your struggle forward. So those kinds of things make me think that we're heading in the right direction. And there's a good connection with, um, with the struggles of the past. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we're now out of time, so I'm going to have to bring the session to a close. But I think that was an incredibly powerful uh, mo like moment to end with. Uh, so I'm happy that we can close the discussion there. I'd like to say a huge thank you to our panelists, Liliane, Hina and Tithi, for participating in this really excellent discussion. Um, I think this is a great way to bring our first day to a close. And I think that, and I certainly hope that the next four days will be just as stimulating and provocative. Also, if you'd like to keep up to date with the latest research and analysis from TNI, please subscribe to the newsletter. You should see a link to that on the slide uh, right here. Um, and I think that uh, that link should be posted in the chat as well. So once again, thank you so much for attending. I've had a wonderful day. I hope you have too. And I'll see you all tomorrow. Good night. Bye.